You're listening to Brand Enabled, the human stories behind branding. This is the place to gain greater insight into the human side of branding. Join Gabriel Cohen as he sits down with branding experts, sharing real life stories of how they faced complex issues along their journey. Learn how others are dealing with maximizing the power of brand and get valuable advice straight from your peers. Here's your host, Gabriel Cohen. Max, it's great having you on the show. I always think it's really fascinating to be able to talk to someone who has such a broad uh, spectrum of experiences and and who's been both agency side and, and, and client side. When you went client side the first time, what was what were the what were the biggest differences for you? Oh, geez, that's a good question. I think the there were a couple there were a couple big differences. One was my life had changed a lot. Even my career changed a lot as I went from agency to to in house for the first time. I was at a point in my career. I had spent thirteen years in advertising, and I was taking a job at NPR, uh, heading up uh, their interaction design team. So creative direction and art direction, very traditional advertising background and jumping over to the in-house. So one of the cultural shifts that I had to go through was, uh, and it has served me for the rest of my career, to be honest, was thinking a little bit less about uh, <laughs> gifting the rest of the organization with my ideas. I think a lot of when I was in advertising, it was about myself, copywriter, maybe a third person, media person, planner, like this little group of people that would be re- working off of a brief and then presenting this, just this amazing set of concepts, hopefully that the client would buy. And versus when I jumped into product development, where it was, it was a fully agile environment, super collaborative, plenty of people there that um, had a lot of creative ideas and had a lot of smart things to add to the table from a variety of disciplines. And so to jump into an environment like that, that was intensely collaborative was, I mean, this is years ago at this point, but I just remember going, going, sitting down at my first agile meeting and just kind of thinking to myself in so many words, when are these, when are this, these people going to just tell me what the problem is so I can go solve it for them. Uh, and I was quickly, obviously, disabused of that notion. It's a far more complex environment, um, which is kind of how I've I've proceeded in my career in general, just to be very collaborative, particularly with people that are as different from me as possible and have as different bring very different things to the table than I do, and to try to connect with those people. That was that that was one cult. That was a cultural shift. The other piece was, and I've I've noticed this in all of my in house job since NPR was that it was just uh, the priorities were a little bit different in-house, that there was a longer tail uh, feeling of being invested and involved in the success of the organization. It was a larger story. I felt like the agency in my agency life, and you know, I think mileage varies with people depending on what type of agency they're from, or the people have had different experiences. My experience was that we were always sort of brought in to solve a specific problem. And then we were on to the next one. We never, we didn't stay. We weren't, we weren't the boots on the ground. We weren't the, we weren't occupying uh, the, the territory. We would just kind of come in, solve it and then leave. And it just, a, it was a different set of priorities and also a different amount of access to internal systems and the business itself. It was a lot, uh, I felt like there was, it was so much easier to just knock on doors, just like, Hey, I work here. I want to understand how the money works. Hey, I work here. I want to understand the sales process. And people were more, or have always been more than willing to to talk in that way. It's like, Oh, we're all part of the same club. It's a lot more difficult. I feel like from the agency side to find those quote unquote right people to talk to. So those are the big, I feel like those are big shifts to turn into sort of an insider and to sort of buy into the organization um, and where it was headed and thinking long-term and also thinking more collaboratively. One of the things I think is really interesting about your background is that you is that you were initially, a, you're, you're a creative director. You come through the, the, that, the, the, the creative side of things and when you go and look at people who are in in enterprise brand roles, 
a lot of times it's rare to see someone who's come up through through that creative through that creative track. It's almost like creative is yeah. oftentimes a pigeonholed within creative. What have how have you been able to uh, shake that off and just and, and just be a brand? You know, translate that into being a brand leader. And what do you think that gives you that's 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 different from someone who doesn't have that background? I think uh, I think that's true. I don't think there's a lot of people that have my background. Um, although, well, I guess there's a couple pieces to that. One is I think that there's a little bit of that uh, you know myth, that creative myth around specific industries and specific job roles being able to own creativity. I think that, and that has been a very difficult thing to shake off. Sometimes it works in my favor. Sometimes, oh, okay, we're going to bring the creative guy in. Sometimes it can really work against me, particularly in these these brand roles, because there are plenty of people within every organization that I've worked in from NPR, New York Times, IBM, Johnson & Johnson, that are designers in their own right, that are creative, innovative thinkers in their own right. And if I walk into the room as a creative person from a creative department that they're not in, so I guess I, I own creative over here, that has been a really important thing to establish that I am here to enable and to complement um, and to sort of uh, meet intuitively as a fellow creator, as a fellow designer from a dis different discipline. Um, and also to sort of awaken that creative uh, that creative sense in other people too. There's a lot, a lot of people that are creative that wouldn't even consider themselves creative. Um, that I think that's an important thing to uh, to try to draw out of people and to identify. So I've tried. I think I've tried hard to uh, be very humble in that way. Uh, to say, hey, design's good for some things. Creativity and brand design is good for some things, but it's not good for everything. To be really clear, I think I think design. This is a really broad statement, but I think in general, design and design thinkers and creative background, people with creative backgrounds inside of organizations can have problems when their role starts to become strategic in nature because design often takes too much credit for what's going on. I think you look at, like, if you look at a design agency or a branding agency's website, you know, you'll see like, oh, look at all these brands that we've built. They don't build the brands. The businesses build their brands. The brand comes from inside, as we know. So designers, I think when they come into these conversations or creative people, there can be a certain resistance from the quote unquote business side of the organization. It's like, okay, who are these people? They're nonlinear thinkers or creative people. They're blue skyers. Like I have ROI things. I'm trying to make money here. These, these people are going to come in and throw monkey wrenches into the situation. There's just sort of, it's just sort of like this left brain, right brain sort of caution. And at any successful business, the people that are the business minded people are running the place. Uh, there's exceptions. There's a lot of design led organizations, but a lot of those people have struck that balance, I think, in those successful organizations between design thinking and business thinking. So I've had to put on sort of my business thinking hat to think. Uh, and I think I've always sort of by temperament, even when I was, in advertising, purely uh, working on conceptual work. I was a very logical thinker. I was about optimizing. I was about kind of like, how's this going to work functionally? That's sort of what led me to product development, I think, because it has a lot of those types of levers in it as well. So I think if I can speak in the business's language as I, as I walk around, metaphor, like whether it's metaphorically or literally through the hallways, to try to really understand the business and to be very functional and results oriented with what we're talking about instead of like, Hey, what if we just did this cool thing? What if we just threw holograms on the moon? What if we just did, it'd be so on brand if we did this, those are great starting places and they can be inspiring, but they can be also very destabilizing conversations. So where, where did you go to sort of acquire that business acumen? Cause it sounds like what you're talking about is what holds, if you were mentoring uh, designers who were either, you know, whether they were in house or, or on agency side, and yeah. and they wanted to not just be thought of like, like you said, just as the as as the creative. And it sounds like it's about bringing that business acumen. Yeah. What would how what advice would you give for sort of how to go and where to go and do that? I wouldn't do it the way I did it, which 
<laughs> it's the school of hard knocks where I feel like I felt like I just would keep coming up with these great ideas and they wouldn't go anywhere. I felt like intuitively they made a lot of sense for, you know, when I was sitting at the New York times, I had a lot of ideas sitting in that role as I headed up the, uh, the, the brand uh, marketing uh, department at the New York times. And I, I had all these, what I thought were great ideas from my team and they just wouldn't go anywhere. But the ones that would, would be the ones that would just surprise, surprise connected to business results. So, you know, we would have these crazy ideas about promoting. I mean, they were cool ideas, but it's just like, they're not going to work. Like we had this cool idea, for example, around, um, cause we were launching the New York times crossword app at the time. It's like, what if we turned the streets of New York into a crossword puzzle and people had to actually be in the actual place on the crossword puzzle to solve the letters of the puzzle? And it would be this crazy big thing. And then if you solve the whole puzzle, uh, you know, using GPS, then you would like go to this cool place, uh, like this mystery final endpoint and be awarded with some kind of prize or meet Will Shorts or something like that. It's a totally cool idea. It makes no like it's like how are you. How you, like, why, you know, it's like awareness building, I suppose. There's a lot of arguments. So there was a lot of ideas like that. They were like, okay, that's cool. I don't know how to, but then there were other more practical things that were just as effective and very on brand. For example, we worked on, uh, we noticed that the online subscription process for becoming a subscriber to the paper was abysmal. Uh, it was just just this terrible experience. You'd be finished. You'd go and you'd be you'd be at the end of uh, reading a heartfelt, compelling story about the topic of your choice. Oh, this is Pulitzer worthy journalism. These people understand me, what I care about, my view of the world. You'd have this real sense of connection. You'd see that subscribe button. You'd be like, yeah, absolutely. It's time. And then you'd get dragged into the back of a used car dealership to try to sell you <laughs> undercoating and warranties that you didn't want, price obfuscation. Uh, I didn't know what I was signing up for, all these kind of crazy things. And the drop-off rate was, you know, as you'd expect, pretty high. People like, this isn't the New York Times. I'm out of here. Thanks. So it was, it was, I guess I realized, so we did, so, so we renovated that process and it was very successful from a business standpoint. It was a very clever idea. It was as clever as maybe it wasn't as grand as the crossword puzzle idea, but it was just as strengthening to the brand, just as effective and just as much of a Rubik's Cube puzzle to solve. So I guess I started realizing through almost trial and error that the successes that I had were about looking for identifying business opportunities and gaps and still using my design brain because I think that that subscription thing is a good example because the business minded people are like, well, we're not going to blow this up. Like, this is how we make our money. Like, we're going to iterate this. Like, maybe we'll try a different color button or something, or we'll try shift and stuff. Let's not go crazy. But if you could bring in sort of that inventive approach to say, what if it was like this? What if it was like Netflix? What if we just had one price? Like, boom. Like, once, like, what if you just made it super simple for people? Let's just try it, see what happens. Uh, if you can kind of bring in that innovative approach and do it safely and you could test it, you can, you know, you can really check to see if it works. I think using, I think having that sense of, you know, I think an MBA would be super helpful for a lot of people. I don't have one. Um, but I think being able to look at the brief and looking at what results are for the client. And if you don't see internal clients, external clients. And if you don't see the numbers, if you don't see the quant and how they're really going to evaluate success in terms of business success, not just creative, like, oh, isn't that a clever idea? It's like clever, but smart. If you're not finding the smart results uh, visible to you, then I encourage, especially when you're in house, there's real advantages there. Just knock on some doors. Like why you know, why are we even doing this project? Why are we even making a crossword app? Like why, who cares? Like, and get people to, to, to open up about the realities of, of how the business works. And then I think that becomes a much more inspiring, creative brief to work off of and a brand brief to work off of. It's interesting. Sometimes you ask someone what, what they did well, 
and they'll tell you a story and they can't necessarily highlight what they did well. And what I thought was interesting about what you just said in the story that you told, but you didn't bring this out as a, as an insight was a lot of, you started talking about empathy and insight as a lead in to what needed to change. This understanding of where that subscriber was coming from and the emotion that they were feeling and what they were all of a sudden thrown into. That's I think sometimes where that, that sense of, Again, is it? It does. It, that's not whether you work as a creative or as a strategist. That's just anyone can bring that through that lens of insight and empathy, but translate it to something as simple. Well, that's going to drive more more conversion if you can extend that voice and that experience, or think about what that person was feeling in that step before getting to that moment that you're trying to convert. I couldn't agree more. I think. I, and I think, uh, you know, the rise of design thinking as a discipline within organizations uh, is maybe that kind of draws a circle around kind of some of this empathic approach. But I again, I feel like that it, it adds a mystique that isn't necessary. Uh, it's it, it's as simple as I think what you described. I think most people are fairly empathic in general. Uh, in their everyday lives. And all of a sudden it's like, well, I'm in this business role now. Like I should set that aside. There's, I know how to be successful inside of this box and it doesn't involve that. Uh, but it, but it can, the way you just described it, I think it can be a, um, I think it can be a real inspiration for what to do next. Um, I think optimization and iteration can only go so far when you start imagining what, how to make people's lives better and the people that you're an expert at uh, because you work with them all the time whether you're in sales or otherwise that's where that that's where those opportunities are hey what if we just did this what if we just tried this i bet people would love that and i think it's easier to do that now these days with uh, kind of the rise of purpose-led organizations and things like that i think it's kind of it's a little it's it's closer to people's minds at least than it has been in the past perhaps where it's like what is my company about like what is this feels like what my company is about. This feels like this might be like you, some of these metrics are a little bit more available to people than they have been in the past. So in, in, in your last role, I feel like a lot of the experience that you had uh, almost sort of led up to that last role in playing this, in, in being the director of, of enterprise brand designer, uh, uh at a at a brand like J and J that has always been very purpose driven. Can you talk a little bit about how a company like J and J views enterprise brand, and if you can just share what you learn about being in an enterprise brand role, and at a point where they decide to go through a transformation, ultimately a rebrand. I think it is very challenging for any organization of that scale and age to hold on to that sense of clear purpose over time. Uh, it's J and J for example, is like 150 years old. It's got well over hundred. Well, it used to have about 130,000 employees, this big giant company. And you look at the history of the legacy of the organization and the purpose is quite strong. It's 150 years ago. It's like the version of Steve Jobs. Like you had these uh, brothers that started this company. They had a very clear purpose in mind. You can look at all of that stuff and their commitment to health and innovation and invention, diversity in the workforce. Like they had all, like, if you look at the story of J&J in like the first couple decades of its, uh, of its run, it's a very strong purpose-led organization. And then I think, it can be very challenging for any company that turns into what j and has turned into, which is a giant holding company of a lot of different brands that in their own right are very strong. You know, you have a company, a, a B2B company like Janssen, who, you know, by the way, the founder is like this crazy innovator. It's like practically like an Albert Einstein of medical technology, you know, and medical advancement well-known guy within his field uh, and the organization itself full of people that just do amazing things like well how do you reconcile and and that's just one company there's there's dozens of companies in the portfolio that all have 
they're there because they're amazing and they were acquired because they're amazing or they signed up on purpose because they're they're these great companies that want to be part of something bigger. So in deciding to go through a brand refresh, what is the, what is yeah. the trigger? Oh, I where, see. Where they decide to say, okay, yeah, let's 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 go do this. Like why? Why go through that effort? That's a great question cuz I think any kind of brand that's reinventing itself, it's at tremendous expense, particularly at that scale. Any company that does this. Um I like I worked when I was at IBM, it wasn't a refresh but it was certainly a repositioning the organization to push into cognitive computing for example that was what was going on at the time it's a big deal to suddenly be about something that you weren't about before and so what you're seeing with j and j right now is with the split of the company from a integrated company that had both consumer and b2b components of it now is j and is now purely a med tech and pharmaceutical organization. So that's a big trigger to start thinking introspectively about yourself. The J&J case, because of where the competition was uh, in their marketplace, they spent a lot of money, as everyone knows, on their consumer branding. So as a result, everybody sees J&J as a Band-Aid and sham- baby shampoo company, everybody, like not, not even just the consumers that they were targeting, also people in the medical field that are unaware of the true nature of uh, what, what J&J has to, to offer. And even on the consumer side, like the B2B to C piece, you walk into an operating room, if you see a J&J device in there, you're like, wait a minute, isn't that the Band-Aid company? What, why is this? I thought this is a, sur- this is a surgical platform. What's going on here? has nothing to do with the quality of the of the products or the services, which are top notch. It's these brand associations that have gone towards this very specific route on the consumer side. So now the challenge is how to reveal essentially what was already there, which was the, a large chunk of the company. I think it's like 80 percent. I'm not really sure, but a big chunk of the company has always been devoted or for a long time has been devoted to innovation in pharmaceuticals and medical technology. There's a crazy amount of stories to be told there. There's a reality of the organization and a legacy of this type of work that needs to be part of the brand. And it has been crowded out by the marketing on the consumer side. So once that's all gone, Now the question is, and this is what triggers the work, it's like, well, the question essentially is, well, how do we hold on to the heart that we have, the purpose that we were born with uh, 150 years ago to a commitment to public health, a commitment to global health now at this point? How do we hold on to that care, like that we're trying to make people's lives better and we're really good at that and we have a sense of that empathy? How do we hold on to that but also strengthen and emphasize the fact that, hey, you know what? We've invented a lot of stuff that we were at the cutting edge and at the forefront of a lot of research and technology. How do we make, because that feels natural to us. Like, it's like like people that if you talk to people at J&J, they're like, yeah, that's what we do. We invent things all day long. We're building all these devices. We're creating all these amazing, amazing cures for things. Like, they're just like, yeah. But then when they go to dinner parties, they don't, they say that they don't work for J&J. Like that's not the first thing that leads out of their mouth. They may refer to the sub brand that they used to work for, or they currently work for. They don't start with the J&J thing because it doesn't, it's not the right foot to lead with. That's the work of the brand, the brand to evolve into that point where they can lead it with J&J at dinner parties to say, oh yeah, J&J, great. Like they're like the Tesla of, you know, healthcare. Great. If that's where we, if, if that's where they decide to go. Um, they need to change those associations because they poured so much blood, sweat, and tears into a very specific set of consumer-minded associations over the years. So you got to run the process uh, in in choosing and hiring uh, what brand agency you're going to partner on on that on that journey on J and J. What is it that you brought to that process from your experience having? been in other corporate brand roles, but also having been 
agency side that you think that, you know, if there's someone who's going through this sort of process, would, would you be your sort of advice? I think that um, the the biggest question about bringing in external lenses into this conversation uh, are how are they going to almost in a in a sort of psychological temperament type of way? How are they going to complement your executive leadership team that's driving this process internally? I think that mileage really varies depending on the organization. Uh, so like do it sounds like you have to do like a Myers-Briggs test on yourself to be like, what are we missing here? What do we need to do? What, what could be helpful to just have someone come in with a fresh objective lens? What sort of prompts and what sort of assessments will we not make ourselves? Like, what are we blind to? Um, and I think that is a very helpful exercise. So for example, for Jane, for the process that we're going through to get help here, in this process, I think we really needed um, to be questioned on the connection between branding and the business. Uh, that how is this a is this a marketing exercise um, that we're going through to create a advertising campaign that will be about telling a you know a story that will be designed to get phones to ring and buttons to click. Or is this an opportunity to signal real change within the organization, like a shift in priorities and a different way of doing business? And I think you, the temperament of a consultant that wants to come in on that case, like a creative agency wants to be like, well, prove it. <laughs> I don't believe you, big giant agent, you know, big giant complacent, huge company that's been successful for over a century. Like really like prove it to me. Um, and to have a little bit of that ability to to speak truth to power a little bit um, and not just kind of agree with what's going on. So having that critical eye. But I don't know if that's always necessary. Sometimes those organizations already have that. And what they require, like, a, for example, if you were going to do a like, let's talk about the New York Times uh, and when Droga came in to really help solidify the New York Times position as that speaking truth to power during a very specific period of time leading up to a presidential election. The New York Times had plenty of sense of purpose, plenty of sense of innovation. Like they had a lot of creativity and innovation going into that, that process. But what they needed was they needed someone to be able to write about them. It was like they couldn't it's hard to, it's almost like biting your own teeth. Like it was really hard for them to tell the story about themselves and to have a little bit of ego about it because reporters tend to be very, uh, very quiet people that you don't see them inside of their work at all. And so it kind of required someone to come in and be like, you're amazing. Like, and we need to talk about this. We need to talk about you having the responsibilities that you have. And the reporters are like, I just want to do my work. So I think that was a good compliment because a reporter could never write that campaign. A reporter could never put that position forward. So I think it's really about trying to find the disruptive, who's going to be the best disruptor for your, uh, the psychological profile that's driving your, uh, the team driving that process. And it's true because you work with different types of agencies as well. And, you know, the pure play brand agency seems to have this, view that uh if you want to do brand work properly you should only use a pure play brand agency because that's what they do every day and the ad agencies um they say we know how to do rebrands as well when do you is is there a sort of recipe or thought for when you should go with one or the other or or or, or a mixed what's your perspective on that that's a good question i think that I think that it is a it is a good idea to go with, I don't know, these are broad generalizations, but I think they're fairly accurate. I think it's a good idea to go with an agency when it's a storytelling problem, like I described. I think that uh, agencies, I think, are very adept at pattern recognition, looking broadly at, at a situation inside of a company and just making it sing at their best. At their worst, 
they're taking like a 1% truth and magnifying it into the whole thing. But if they're doing their jobs right, I think they're looking at the organization and they're bringing poetry to it. They're dramatizing it to a certain degree. It's almost like a historical film that brings epic grandeur to like a historical event. It's like they're going to take the facts and make them beautiful to a particular audience. And they're going to reveal, they're not going to invent anything. They're going to reveal these things beautifully. I think when, I think there is often though more work to do than that when you're talking about an organization like Johnson and Johnson or IBM, not that agencies haven't done great work for those places, but so much of the brand experience is through really specific interactions with products that the majority of people's associations, whether they're B2B or consumer, or whatever, are through using the products through going through an interface through, through saving people, some life or through or through interacting with people when you if you're a service brand or b2b right absolutely and those types of things you really have to sweat the details and you really got to ride you got to ride with them like journalism like journalists like you got to ride with those people and do the hard work of trying to see the world as they see them see the as, see the world as they see it see problems as they see them so that you can optimize and and shape the brand at that point of contact. And I think that's just a different type of thinking. There's, I'm sure there's agencies that work that way, just like I'm sure that there are, uh, you know, brand agencies, like advertising agencies that work that way, just like I'm sure there's brand agencies that tell great stories. But I think in general, those tend to be the poles of like really like climbing in with the business to understand their systems, their process, their customer journey, and looking kind of almost media agnostic at like, you know what, we shouldn't do a campaign at all. Like this isn't a storytelling problem. This is a subscription problem. We need to optimize your subscription flow uh, or there's an opportunity there. Um, you know what, this is like a sales conversation. Like they need to almost be like execution agnostic where I think agents, advertising agencies can often, it's like everything looks like to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, like everything looks like a campaign. Uh, and the nice flexibility of a branding agency is like, you know, they don't have any, they don't have any uh, particular uh, bias towards execution. Again, if they're doing their jobs, right. I think they'll, they'll really try to look at what the opportunity is and then play to that opportunity and then teach people to fish. It's like, Hey, we're not going to come in here and fix the thing for you. We're going to point this out and then you should like, if you think this is a problem and you think like, we're going to talk about how this is off brand, like you should probably change your sales process. You should probably commit yourself to sustainable packaging. If you're, you know, if you keep talking about that all the time about being a zero carbon footprint company, you should probably blow up this factory, this factory, this factory, retool all of those. Like those are the kind of conversations that I think a branding agency can have and an ad agency May may spitball those ideas, but they're not going to go into the hard work of doing those things. Well, with you. well and because of the way that, that their business model operates, because they've got all this investment in 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 creative, it's built into their business yeah. model. I've always said that it's a bit of a question of scope versus scale. Where mm. a brand agency is is going to, if they're doing their job well, is more likely to come in and say, you know, you need to shift some of your dollars from advertising, actually put it into the customer experience, put it into your customer call center, and put it into training. Because that's going to improve the experience. It's going to generate more word of mouth. There's no point in advertising more if um, if you need to fix some of those other elements. Yeah, I think that's right. I, and I think it's not. Yeah, it's kind of. A, it's not a question of one being better than the other. It's kind of like making sure like you're just solving the right problem. I think it particularly now when the op the ability for consumers, whether they're B2B or con traditional consumers or whatever, the ability for just people to be able to tell that you're BSing them about what you're doing, that you're talking about this, but you're not doing anything that you're talking, like the trend level of transparency is just at an all time high for that and the accountability and people just have no patience for that stuff anymore. Even the businesses themselves. I read something the other day that was you know, like the, the 180, 180 of the top 200 companies in the world now have said that their commitment to, uh, like their driving principles are no longer about shareholder value, that it's about like making the world better. Like that's like, 
people like they and they're doing they're not doing that because they think it's a necessarily a good they they do it because they're accountable like that that they know that that's where people actually that that they're they're thinking about the future they're thinking about where things are going and they want to align themselves with the brands and the companies that are doing that and it just didn't used to be that way i think you just you could kind of just tell people what you were up to and they're like oh i guess that's what they're up to based on the advertising so max when you think about going through this 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 process it must have been really interesting being on the being on the client side and being in the room watching all the different branding agencies uh, present. Can you share any any insight around how uh, how pitching and the role of a branding agency has changed maybe five, ten years to to what it is to what it is now? Yeah, you know, how did the agency really sort of stand out in their in their in their proposals and pitches take us take us behind the scenes yeah. into the room and the conversations sure well there were a spectrum of agencies that we talked to um like we've discussed i think there were agencies of different temperament different reputation some that were uh, a little bit more known for being firebrands and being outspoken being challengers to conversations there were others that were more systems oriented and could really operate at the scale that we were comfortable with had a long track record of doing things like that and another category might be agencies that we'd worked with in the past I mean, we're just such a jj is such a large organization that you know there's a lot of agencies that have come in and helped out and have collaborated over the years. So there's plenty of places that know the brand pretty well historically. I think that was one of the things that was that was different, um, maybe from other times that I've gone through this process. I think the agencies that that knew us, that had worked with us, I wouldn't say that they were necessarily too comfortable with us. Uh, they weren't, you know, they didn't make too, assumptions, but I think they probably could have benefited from asking more questions and taking more of a, I think more of a, uh, uh, a neutral approach, more objective approach to try to act, to try to understand how much of a revolution or an evolution this was. I think J and J probably has a reputation of being a fairly conservative company when it comes to projecting the brand, and so th their experiences, I think, confirmed those types of impressions and the projects that they had worked on. However, this is sort of a a big moment historically for the some, somewhat unprecedented. I don't think this has ever happened for of a company of the scale. So, I think that some of those folks underestimated how much of an appetite there was for change here. And they probably just could have benefited from, instead of assuming that uh, they knew the political climate, that they probably could have leveraged that political climate and asked some questions about, hey, is it business as usual? This seems like a pretty big thing. Um, should we come in? Like, we have some assumptions. Are these correct all of the, of course, every agency we that asked for it, we had an initial conversation with a Q&A before they came back with a proposal. In fact, they probably could have asked for a second or third if they wanted. They could ask as many questions as they wanted, but I don't think uh, the smarter ones just happened to be the ones that didn't know us very well. So they could ask a lot of quote unquote stupid questions, which are not stupid at all. So how much, how invasive is this? What kind of company do you want to be when you grow up? And it was, I think it might've been hard in some ways for the agencies that had existing relationships, not present existing relationships, but that had known us. I felt like they almost felt like they, they should have already known the answers to those questions. So they were probably afraid to ask them, but I think it would have benefited the process quite a bit if they had sort of maybe been proud and had, described their background with us. Hey, we know you a lot. We know this, that, the other thing. This could all be wrong though. So let's talk about it. I think that would have been a better a better approach uh, to to that and to trying to figure out what the problem was uh, and the challenge that was at hand. You're sort of cursed with knowledge a bit, right? It's a bit of a like importance of you need to forget what you know sometimes when you get into this, when you get into the process if you've already been working with them. 
I, I think that's right. And I think, um, I think if you can act, have that, what you know, they call it the beginner's mind, right? If you can just have that sort of just that a little bit of, of curiosity, a little bit of just objective, hey, I'm a new new person here. I just want to ask some questions. They might seem pedestrian, but I just want to level set. If there's a way to if, if there's a way to get to that type of conversation, then I think that that's that's worth it. Um, I think the other thing that kind of right next to that is there were certain parameters that were built into uh, the RFP that said, hey, here's a zone that we want. Here's a lane that we want you to play in. And here's here are lanes that are covered by other either internal resources or other partner agencies. Uh, for example, and this is quite significant, I think we had uh, another agency that we were working with that was going to be working on the positioning and had some initial recommendations on architecture, but those weren't set in stone just on kind of how that wanted to go. So in the RFP, it said, hey, this stuff's already taken care of. We want you really to focus more on the more, by really on the identity refresh. And I think to the credit of some of the agencies that were involved in the pitch, they a few of them ignored that. <laughs> they said, uh, or they didn't ignore it. They reasoned through it. That's probably a better way to say it. They said, essentially, in their own ways, you can't do this work, as we all know here. You can't do this type of work, this identity work, without being part of that positioning process and without collaborating heavily there and having a point of view on it, well, so on and so forth. And they kind of just did it anyway, because it was all part of a, an approach. Uh, you know, a lot of the agencies came with just thought starter. Hey, maybe the identity should be this or this or this. We don't know. We're just going to show you how our brains work. And part of how our brains work inevitably will lead to these larger questions of what you stand for, how this connects to your purpose. They couldn't really pen themselves in to just being, you know, just limited to that one sphere and ultimately, that served them very well. The ones that swam in their lanes tightly, they kind of technically, they probably scored an A plus on the brief, but they scored a, I don't know, B plus. I mean, it was great work. All of it was great work, but they didn't, they just, they kind of fell a little short compared to these other agencies because ultimately, those agencies that showed how their brains worked all the way through the process and were honest to themselves, like, hey, this is just how we are. This is how we work best. Um, this is how, based on what you've told us, this is how we would recommend approaching it. It almost is like a, it's almost like a clinical approach, I feel like, in a way to design problems and branding problems. It's like when you go to the doctor, you know, and the doctor just tells you like, hey, you know, I'm seeing your chart here. Really looks like you, you're smoking here. You're telling me like, you look at look at your liver, you're drinking too much. The doctor's not going to get mad at you about it. They're they're just an expert. They're going to tell you, like, I can tell you you're shaving years off your life. I can tell you probably shouldn't do this. Do what you want. But they're speaking from a position of expertise, uh, not an opinion, not like, why are you a bad person in smoking? And that was sort of what these agencies were able to pull off was this clinical approach. Like, hey, just based on what we're seeing here, I know you wrote the brief like this, but this isn't really how we see this working. And it wasn't like you guys wrote a bad brief. It wasn't, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. It was just, this is how we work. And there's really smart and uh, there's a big there's a big rationale and a lot of smart work that we've done in this way. Let, me, let us show you three cases, how we've done it this way. And it's been super successful. Um, and ultimately that prevailed, which I thought was, uh, was really, really good. I think, um, I, I think it was interesting because it really became about, expertise in chemistry and not not painting by numbers. Um, I think we talked earlier about, you know, the temperament of different organizations. There might have been other, it, it's very possible, and maybe it was just a miscalculation. Again, j and is sort of a, a very, from the outside, looks like a very conservative company when it comes to these types of things. So maybe there might have been a concern, hey, geez, if we color outside the lines here, like we won't even get in the room, like this is going to be bad. But do you really want to get in the room if you're the kind of agency that has to conform 
to, you know, these restrictions in order to just even get in there and kind of sacrifice your approach and your expertise in order to shoehorn into what the client's structure is? I mean, the answer is probably it's a little bit of a push and pull. There's probably a compromise there. Um, but for those those agencies that kind of stayed true to themselves ended up doing a lot better. How, how um, w- when you think about going through that process and you get to the final pitch, how much of a perception do you already have around where you might be leaning, even going into that final presentation? And what are some of the factors that that might have influenced that? For example, is it, you know, even during the Q&A process, do you, are you already, you know, the, the types of questions that people are asking, that level of curiosity, how much is that already sort of impacting your perception and going into that pitch? You know, like, are you going in with that notion of, I'm sort of leaning here, I, I, I might still be swayed. I mean, maybe talk a bit about that, because I'm giving you a lot of leading. I'm asking the question and almost <laughs> answering it for you. Oh, those are all great questions. I mean, I think there's certainly, uh, I mean, at the, at the, At the very base level or this most superficial level, there's, I think the first impressions are, they are formed when the team walks in the room. Um, How many people do they bring? Did they bring as many people as you have? Did they bring a handful of people? How important is this to them? Is it too important? And they brought twice as many people. I think having a little bit of symmetry there is good, of course, you know, that's obvious stuff, but also... I think having a complement of people that can mirror the client side. So if you have design represented, if you have a, if, if you if you're reading the the invite list and you're talking to them in these initial Q and A sessions, and you see, oh, design's playing a huge role in this. We should probably bring a deeper bench, obviously. If design's not, then maybe you shouldn't. But I think making sure that you proportionalize the importance that you're reading based on who's participating in the process with your team as the agency team that's coming to the table. And I think also the chemistry of that group. You just read that stuff. It's These are just basics, I think. But I don't know. I, I feel like it's surprising how many really well-established agencies tend to to stumble on some of these basic things um, that, and I think it's also due to their, perhaps their scale. So a lot of these people walking in the room, they've never, you can tell they've never met each other before, half of them. You know, you can tell that they flew the the lead creative in from, you know, Eastern Europe or something or wherever he he was running around and they brought the president in and she's coming in from, and they just kind of like this assembled this Voltron uh, force for the sake of this meeting itself. And you can tell there isn't a lot of chemistry there. Um, and that comes out real quickly. I think so you're not just looking at the chemistry between the agency and, and the team. You're also, it's also important to, you're also looking at and feeling the energy and the chemistry between the team themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Does it, does it feel like they work together as a team? Um and I think, you know, to, it's not like it has to be something where they've all worked with each other for 10 years and there, there's just a, but I think if there's a sense of we've all worked on this project together, we have a shared vision, we all see ourselves as facets in this project and we understand our place in it. It's a lot to ask because no one's getting paid anything for this, obviously. It's a, this whole thing that's speculative. And I understand, I appreciate that the scale of pitches, you know, you've got, Probably if you're at this level of success and you're coming into the room pitching J&J, you probably have a lot of a lot on your rotisserie. Um, but I think that's that's just part of it. I think it's exactly what you said. It's making it feel like uh, or, or, or making it clear that this is a team that that has their eye on the ball. They're curious. They're asking questions. Uh, like you said, I think. Um, I think those those things are very important. I think that also how much they uh, how much I mean I think then this is just uh, again it's I think it's fairly straightforward. But again, I'm surprised at how many people miss this. But to ha- to be able to leave a lot of room for discussion and to engineer your presentation 
to actually be about discussion. Everybody says they're about discussion, but nobody actually does it. It feels like plenty of, you know, stop us wherever you want for Q&A, you know, stop us anywhere for questions. But they've built like a 55 minute presentation for like a 60 minute thing. I think if there's ways to architect it, so it's about the goal, I feel like you, the goal is to walk out of the room, in my opinion, with a, that particularly in the first round to say like, okay, they clearly get the problem or they understand how to approach the problem. At least maybe they don't get the whole thing, can wrap their head around it, but they're starting to, it's starting to dawn on them how complicated we are and how much, how the magnitude of the problem perhaps. And they're all, it's also something where you can tell that the agency cares and that they are, they know what they don't know. And they have a lot of, a lot of smart questions to ask. And they're very comfortable being off script because they're just very talented people that can extemporaneize or improvise uh, on the fly. I think that's really important. It's tricky because a lot of times I feel like you want to bring in more junior people to give them a lot of pitch experience. And I think that's fine, but I think balancing that with more, senior people is really important so that you feel like you have, I think the benefit of that seniority is that they can just go, the questions will go sideways or up and down and those senior people can kind of pivot and then perhaps hand off to a junior person to be able to elaborate in a particular line of questioning. What are some of the good or not so good ways that that, you, that you've seen or maybe that you've even participated in uh, of, of engineering a discussion? Because sometimes you try and do that in a way that and and it sort of falls it falls very it falls very flat. There any yeah, good stories it, like best examples that you've seen where that was done really well? Yeah, I guess yeah. I, I know I know those times where it's gone poorly too. It's almost like a stand up comedian. It's like crickets in the room. You're like right, right. It's like anybody want to say anything? And there's nothing there. Yeah, I think it's I think having a back having a backup plan for no discussion is great. So you can fill the air uh, with answers to your own questions. So I think that that's, that's been that, the, I think that's a good, that's a good backup plan. But in terms of examples of things where it's gone really well, I think that uh, one approach was when uh, I think getting a sense of what the architecture of the presentation is going to be up front. So there's a clear sense in the audience's mind about what's going to be covered, um, how many concepts are we going to look at. So they kind of have a sense of where the fuel gauge is on this thing, because a lot of people don't want to speak until they've seen everything. Some people, they just want to see it all. And it it's hard for non like the, I feel like design people will say stuff right away. They'll just be like, oh, like they're used to like critiquing stuff on the fly and like everything's kind of the clay is soft and like I'll just like poke holes and ask questions. But other more analytical people in the room, sometimes some of them are just incapable of conversation just because they need to like go away, think about it. They took a bunch of notes. You can see those people writing like crazy. Like they need to like ferment on that and come back. But there's people that are sort of in the middle that I think are a little analytical and they're probably, they have some, they have some questions about the agency and their process and their approach to things. I think if you can keep it away from evaluation, come in with like three different ideas, for example, just to show how well you worked. I don't think getting into a conversation, you're like, so what do you think about this? So what do you think about that? It's like way too soon. Uh, it's, it, it feels like it puts people in a place where they might get any, it, it'll feel like they get the answer wrong. It's like, well, I like this one. I don't like this one. It's like, I don't want to, they don't want to commit to those kinds of conversations, but if you can keep the bar lower around process, like what's your creative process like? Um, do you tend to like three different directions? Do you tend like this, like one of the agencies came and said, well, we like to triangulate our coordinates with, are creative. We like to come up with something that feels really close in, that feels like it's a very conservative angle. Then we like to come up with something that's kind of crazy. And then we like to come up with something that's even crazier. Like that's how our approach works. And these are the, the reasons why we think this is crazy is because of this. We think you guys are not 
perceived as innovative. So the craziest thing over here, for example, is showing you guys like you're the Tesla of healthcare. Like that's what this looks like. Do you think you guys are the Tesla of healthcare? Like, do, are there people in the organization that feel that way? We were sort of curious about how innovation works at J&J because what we're seeing is that it's sort of in a pocket, that it looks like there's a place called J&J Innovation. But we were kind of curious, does, is innovation sort of something that lives throughout the organization? This will This helps us because as we're developing concepts for you to get a sense of where creativity is within the organization will be a real source of inspiration for us. So almost even asking the question is kind of like, oh, those guys work kind of, that's a cool way of working. Um, so I think leading questions like that to sort of reveal why you're asking the question and that sort of reveal your what's important to you as you're working through ideas are great ways to start conversations because it allows people to kind of come back to say, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's tough. I don't know. I don't feel like I have, I haven't seen innovation from where I am over in my part of the business, or I say, they'll say very proudly, you know, innovation's everywhere. It's a huge problem. Like nobody understands, which isn't the case, you know, nobody sees it, but it's everywhere. And we just have a really bad time trying to communicate that. Uh, I don't know. So I think that's one one approach is to sort of stay, keep it a little bit more abstract and less evaluative and give people excuses to speak to their own expertise. Everyone loves talking about what they know. So if you can figure out ways to get people to contribute based on, you know, if you have a media person in the room, make some observations about the media spend and the media mix based on what you're seeing and and disclaimer it like crazy like we probably have it wrong we don't see everything but this is we noticed that you guys have had a heavy looks like your your social media approach has really spiked over the last six months and has really focused on personal health versus global health for example it looked like we were seeing sort of a sea change there is there a way is that something that your team how much of an emphasis do you put on connecting your larger campaign messaging to the social work? We're just curious because we love to do that. We love to s stitch that stuff together. We're super integrated. We love, and kind of, I think putting out those types of questions that let people speak to what they're good at um, is the is your best shot. It's not foolproof, but I think it's your best shot. No, and hopefully there's a lot of really great learnings from all of this that anyone who's listening, uh, who's client side in thinking about how to evaluate uh, agencies in in this sort of process as well. Max, this has been uh, absolutely, absolutely fantastic, a brilliant conversation. I think we could have kept going for uh, two more hours, uh, but thank you so much for 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 being part of this. And thank you. It's it's always fun to talk about the work and the process. I think um, as a creative person, I'm always the one, I always like to listen to directors' commentaries and behind the scenes things. So it's so important, I feel like to, and to get a sense of how other people work too. I'm a big fan of of this podcast and the work that you've been doing. So keep it going. Thanks, Max. I love the director's cut idea. I'm totally, totally going to use it. Thanks so much for being on. <laughs> all right. That's all for today's episode. We hope these insights from top brand leaders help you as you face your own branding roadblocks. Remember that you're not alone in the challenges you face, and there are always impactful, creative, and human ways to solve brand problems. If you would like to further connect with fellow elite brand leaders and join our community, send an email to gcohen at monogle.com. Thank you for joining us. See you on the next one.